those of you who are here from elsewhere, welcome to Chicago. I, I have to say, as somebody who's in a sort of a um, career inflection point myself, I looked with envy at, at the way you were spending your time these three weeks. Uh, I think that you know nobody can assume anymore that they're going to be starting in one career and staying in it all their lives. I certainly didn't. Uh, and having the kind of methodology that you've been given to think about uh, options uh, uh, is really a wonderful luxury, and I hope it's been as fun to do as it looks like it's been. Uh, so I'll just give you a little of my personal biography, and um, and then you know we can kind of go down the table, and then we can maybe circle back and talk about our institutions, which are each are quite different one from the other in what they do and how they do it, and how many people work there, and what kind of skills those people need. They're just you know philanthropy is not a, a monolith. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think if there's any one uh, message to you'll know, walk away from, it's that they're you know it's as diverse practically as the nonprofit sector that it supports. Um, so where did I, I start? I moved to Chicago to finish undergraduate at the University of Chicago, uh, having started somewhere else. Uh, when I was done, I had a big student loan. I had to figure out how to uh, pay it off. I, I didn't have the luxury that some of my friends had <coughs> to go off on their trek through South America. Um, <laughs> So I, um, I started looking for a job, and at that point I thought I wanted to go to law school. It doesn't everybody <laughs> when they finish college. And I, uh, I went and worked for a neighborhood law firm in Hyde Park, uh, realized what the nitty gritty of uh, legal work was like. Uh, so I started looking around for something else to do. <laughs> and, um, and I was very lucky because there had just been uh, a legal ruling in Chicago that the city had to start hiring from the civil service test list instead of just through patronage. It was called the Shackman Decree, and I was probably one of the very first beneficiaries of it. I took a bunch of civil service tests, and I actually, I tell a lot of people who are undergraduates uh, and are interested in public policy uh, not to ignore ac or public sector jobs, because public sector jobs are where you do public policy. And, and I guess I would say the same to all of you, and you probably have had that, uh, you've had your public sector day, I imagine. But, um, but that's what I started uh, doing after about, I took the test after about six months. I, w <laughs> I was invited to come work for the Chicago uh, uh, Department of Plan Development and Planning in those days um, as a planning assistant. And I really learned about a field that I'd never known anything about, which was uh, urban planning neighborhood planning uh, more specifically, and I really liked it. I had an anthropology degree uh, looking at neighborhoods, uh, was not so far uh, away from what I'd been, I had been studying. Uh, I loved the city and I loved getting to know it really well and I got to know it really well. Um, and I also at that job, which I stayed in almost, you know, it's kind of surprising given that it was practically my first job, I stayed for five years. Um, and, um, you know, while I loved the work, I also learned how to work in a bureaucracy. And that is, uh, is uh, that was a lesson that has served me well ever since. Almost anywhere you look, you, there, our bureaucracies and being able to negotiate them is a, is a handy thing. And it's, it's especially handy to learn to negotiate a bureaucracy where you have kind of fundamental policy disagreements with the top, at the top, with the top. You know, there are things you can do. I remember reading a book uh, when I was very young and in that job called Gorillas and the Bureaucracy about how you can be effective within a big organization even if you, you know, even if there are policies that you don't agree with. Um, and I <coughs> ended up, I did a lot of different things there, uh, but I ended up with probably, you know, something I never imagined, uh, which was a real, a real planning project, uh, which was the reuse of the old municipal tuberculosis sanitarium on the northwest side of Chicago, it was 160, I think, acres of um, un, pretty much you know, undeveloped uh, resource for the city, uh, wonderful old buildings, um, you know, old-fashioned wheelchairs and lungs and jars <laughs> in the basement when I first went out there. And, uh, but the neighborhood really wanted it for its um, benefit. 
and the benefit of the city. So I ended up doing a lot of work with, on that project um, until the winter of the big snow, big cold, the one where uh, the Chicago machine mayor uh, was ousted by a so-called reformer, Jane Byrne. Um, but I was also, I was also going to graduate school at the University of Illinois in Chicago, getting a planning degree. It was too much transportation in a transportation impossible winter. <laughs> and so I left that job. I went and worked at uh, UIC for a little while while I finished my degree. And, and um, it was just, it was a master's, not a PhD. And, um, um, uh, you know, worked with students there and worked in the economic development program. And then uh, our reform mayor was elected. She uh, established a new department, the housing department. And uh, I went back there as director of planning. I was really young. Um, I don't know why that what they were thinking of to hire me in that job. Uh, but you know, it was uh, also a, a wonderful uh, learning opportunity. Uh, we we got to kind of uh, the thing about public sector work. I would say is that you beat your head against the wall most of the time. But when you succeed, you succeed big. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you, what you manage to, uh, you know, the, pol the policies or programs you manage to accomplish really have a lot of impact. And it was very satisfying. I worked on housing and housing finance. I worked with neighborhood groups. Really liked it for a while. And then I was, you know, and one of these things that happens is that as you move up, you, you find it a little hard to be the gorilla in the bureaucracy. <coughs> um, and so I got to the point where I wasn't happy uh, disagreeing fun fundamentally with some of the policies of city government. I went off and <coughs> worked at a nonprofit. I went to a, a group called the Woodstock Institute. It's still around. Uh, it was work. It was established to uh, work on fair housing and uh, banking. Uh, so we were an anti-redlining group, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, we were very small. And you know, it was just kind of the opposite of public sector work, uh, where people tell you no, 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 no. In a nonprofit, uh, you can do anything you want if you can raise the money for it. <laughs> and um, and this is a, a lesson I've tried to remember. I tried to remember, keep in mind when I when I jumped the fence to foundation work. Because um, uh, in foundations, you're helping other people do their work. Uh, if you're in a nonprofit, you're 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 on the line. You're you're doing it yourself. Um, I had a really satisfying six years at Woodstock Institute. I became its president and CEO <coughs> after about three years there. Uh, we. Um, you, we, we like to call ourselves a think and action tank. Um, we did research. We actually hired PhD, uh, uh, PhD people to do the research so that we would, you know, have, uh, we could be sure we had gotten the story right. We did research on banking. At one point we found that the big banks in Chicago uh, were making a dollar's worth of loans in low and moderate income neighborhoods for every $10 they got in deposits. It was shocking. We used that argument and that research to negotiate what I think was may still stand as the biggest uh, community reinvestment act agreement ever. We got $100 million for Chicago neighborhoods uh, through that. It was really exciting kind of work with a, an activist, um, activist element as well as a sort of a policy element. Uh, we were we had some impact around the country. Uh, we did some lending uh, lending research and lending agreements in other parts of the country, um, and you know we worked within the kind of system of advocates, policy analysts, funders, government regulations because we were using the Community Reinvestment Act as our tool. Um, we were and we were working with community activists who you know whose energy and Outrage was important, so it you know it was the whole system that made those things those accomplishments happen. Um, I left there because my husband had a full right to work in Guatemala, mm -hmm. and I uh, went and spent about a year with him, a little over a year. We spent in Guatemala. I did some uh, micro enterprise work while I was there, uh, as well as some volunteer work uh, with women's uh, weaving project 
everybody who goes to Guatemala works with the Women's Weaving <laughs> Project. Um, but I, I found that my planning uh, skills were useful, you know, even though we were all working in a, in a language we didn't, you know, it wasn't our first language, it was really fun, it was, it, and it was interesting. Um, came back, uh, had one of those transition periods that I'm in right now where I did some consulting, and then I went to the MacArthur Foundation. And um, uh, my, I was hired at the MacArthur Foundation um, to uh, work in something called the General Program. I was hired as a program officer. Um, MacArthur was very young in those days. Uh, that was 1991. It was it was maybe a teenager, I guess. MacArthur was a teenager, <laughs> young teenager, and we were still, you know, the, it was still trying to figure things out. It had a lot of money to give away. Had a, there's a requirement, uh, an IRS requirement that foundations give away a certain amount of their money uh, every year, and um, um, very small staff at that time. Uh, practically no guidelines. Uh, we didn't have budgets in those days. Uh, it was it was really a sort of a, a, a you know a build the plane while you're flying it kind of uh, situation, which was really uh, lots of fun and interesting. Um, but because of where I sat, which was uh, not in a particular field-based program, I got to do a lot of different things. So my first year there, uh, general program did big initiatives. One on um, one on um, the what we called indigenous voices the Columbus quincentenary the 1992 quincentenary was coming up we were um, we were concerned that it was all going to be a celebration of conquest uh, so instead of that we made a lot of grants to the indigenous organizations throughout the Americas to use to use the time to tell their story um, the day the proposals were due we, we had invited people to send them in by fax. We walked in on a Monday morning and our fax room was just filled with paper in all different languages without numbers. <laughs> so we had to, first thing we had to do was figure out what pages went with what and the second, uh, and the second, <laughs> the second thing we had to do was find people who uh, could speak you know, and read the different languages, um, and um, and it was you know a crazy but you know very well intentioned project, and I think it helped. I mean, the things we did that really worked may, were not the ones we expected, but that's another story. We also did one on elections at that point, um, and uh, but later on, I worked on international human rights. I worked on the establishment of the International Criminal Court. Uh, I worked on gun violence prevention, drug policy, um, uh, intellectual uh, property rights in a changing technology environment. Um, and, and later on, um, strengthening the pillars of doc democracy, voting, uh, campaign finance, and, and other things, um, um, investigative journalism and media, uh, and uh, arts and culture in Chicago. So I will <coughs> stop, oh, let me just, the, and so the last little piece of my story, the latest little piece is that I left uh, MacArthur at the end of December uh, after almost 25 years. Um, and um, uh, before that time I had a, a six, about a six month sabbatical to try to kind of reorient myself so that I could think beyond that sort of mindset that I'd lived for so long. Uh, and I, um, and I'm, I started a consulting firm, and I was just telling them, uh, Allison and others uh, here that I, I'm doing work on, in the arts, I'm doing back to my community development uh, roots, I'm doing some work in Memphis, mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing some work in philanthropy, uh, so I'm exploring, kind of the way some of you probably are as so. well. Hi. Hi. Sure. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Nice to see you. Hi. How, How are, are you? Good to Sorry. see you. Old friends. Cheryl is from the Chicago Community Trust. To learn more about her when her turn So yeah. Cheryl, what we're doing is we're each mm -hmm. going to like tell our professional story, then we're going to go back around and talk about our, our organization. Great. So. 
So my name is Sujata. Let me start with my name first. Um, so my name is, uh, full name is K Sujata. K stands for my ancestral village. It's a village I've never been to. My family has no property there. It's, uh, it's in the southern part of India, but there's a tradition of using uh, the initial of your of ancestral village as, as, a, as an identifier. And so I've, I've kept that. It's often a question that people ask. So my first name, my given name is Sujata. I, so I grew up in India and came to the US to go to graduate school. My family was full of English majors. My, my father was uh, a professor of English literature, became and, and grew to become uh, not only the principal of a college, but eventually ended up being uh, the, the vice chancellor of a university, which in the US terms is like a president of, of a university. Um, <coughs> I had uncles who were professors at the University of Chicago, you know, doing folklore, actually a MacArthur genius who ended up uh, writing, um, translating actually. Uh, his name is A.K. Ramanujan. He wrote. Oh, uh, class. So wonderful. So, uh, so he he was he was a linguist and and wrote, uh, uh, you know, translated folk folk stories from Tamil and Kannada and so on. Had my my paternal uh, uncle taught English, and and German. So I come from a family of folks who are primarily from the humanities. I do have a, an uncle who's a physicist and another one who's a, a metallurgist. So they're sort of outliers in my, in my family. But, uh, but my, my grandfather was, um, was, a, uh, was a mathematician. So, so it really is, it was a, my family uh, is full of all kinds of PhDs. I am the slacker uh, in my family, <laughs> so I have not grown to, uh, get a MacArthur Genius Award or, or anything uh, close <coughs> to any of what the other folks in my family have accomplished. I say this to say that um, I started uh, my, my career, I, so I wanted to be, given all the people in my family, I wanted to be a literary critic, right? <laughs> who wouldn't, right? All my, I had family members who, who did that work. Um, until I was, I was studying for my final exams, uh, for my final high school exams, and my father said to me, so what is it you're going to do? I'm like, oh, I want to be a literary critic. He's like, what? <laughs> well, you need to put the food on the table, you know? <laughs> like, why? So to, to, be a, to be a literary critic, you have to be either very, very good, and you have to be not only very, very good, but you also have to be lucky in order to get published and to be able to put food on the table. So you may as well do something that is, you know, you can always read and you can always read and criticize. Nobody's going to stop you from doing that. But uh, you can do something that will put on the table and be mediocre at it. So I decided I wanted to become an engineer. <laughs> Uh, and th the reason I became an engineer was I had two options, either an engineer or a doctor. I, as I said, I, was, I grew up in India, so those were the two options. I hated biology, particularly zoology, with a passion. I couldn't stand the thought of dissecting frogs and earthworms. So the only option left for me was, um, was engineering. So I went to engineering college. and and thought that like everybody else in my family, I would be an academic as well. But it became rapidly clear that in order, so in order to be an academic, you of course need a PhD. So I came to the US to do a PhD because it would have taken twice as long if I had stayed in India to do it. And it became rapidly clear to me that being an academic was not really a useful proposition because I wanted to be able to do something that would show results in my lifetime. And here I am doing something that's never going to show results in my life. But nevertheless. Except every day. <laughs> nevertheless, but, but so, so I decided that, and especially in engineering, it's possible to do things that will show you, will get you to results uh, that are practical, that are tangible. Um, and so, so, so that's when I made the decision. And, I have to say, I, I feel your, when I say I feel your pain of doing a PhD, I really do feel your pain. I, I think of it now, and, um, and this is not to be discouraging. <laughs> um, I, I think of it as, as a, 
as a prison sentence. <laughs> you know, you're in, you're in for four hours. You know, <coughs> for year, for four years, you know you're going to get out at the end. There's no option. You're you're going to get out. What you do at the end of it is kind of what what you decide. Um, so I uh, worked, um, uh, so when I got my PhD, it was a time of recession. I didn't have a, quite then a green card yet. It was a difficult time uh, to get a job, even with a PhD. Um, so I decided to work as a, as a postdoc, as a scientist, with it and, and then on as a research scientist at the university at, at Northwestern. I went to Northwestern University. Um, and and continue to think about this idea of like I want to do something practical. So I got a job working at one of the uh, cement factories in Gary, Indiana, uh, as as uh, as a manager for new product developments and and eventually quality. I had I had the opportunity to take on a, a quite a big role within within the organization to to do different things, you know, um, that was the time of, I don't know how, how many of this would be familiar to any of you, but there were the international standards, in or, uh, to establish international standards, so you could sell, sell your products in, in Europe was very important. Um, and we were one of the first plans to get the ISO, it was called the uh, International Standards 9000. Um, and I was put in charge of that, and I got to work with the entire plant through through you know, from the time the product, uh, from the time the supplies, the raw materials came in to the organization, all the way to the point that the final product, the cement product, was was shipped out, and looking at both customer satisfaction as well as a supplier uh, engagement. So truly, an opportunity to to do a variety of things. And, and at that time, I, I understood that what I wanted to do was. What I really enjoyed doing was having my finger in many different pies. What was great about that position was that I was allowed the opportunity to try a number of different things, um, whether or not that was something that I was trained for. Um, unfortunately, um, the, the plant was going through some difficult times. It, it had a harbor. It had a lot of acreage, and it had a harbor. Um, and Trump wanted to build a casino. So, and and the product and and the company, <coughs> the cement company, also had bought a plant, had had done a couple of mergers and bought a plant in Croatia, s where they were producing very similar products. So it was very clear that the plant would close in a couple of years. So I went on to look for uh, another position and went to work for another. Uh, company, uh, another manufacturing facility in the city, in Chicago, where they manufactured handheld dental instruments. It was a privately owned company, um, and the only people that they would move into executive positions were either family members or folks they brought in from outside. So I'd risen as high as I could go within that company, and it was clear to me that I needed to I'd, I'd been there a very short time, actually, um, and I uh, sort of, uh, around that time, um, I, I had an offer. But before I tell you about that offer, uh, I just want to let you know that w after I finished my PhD, or even during, actually, I did a lot of volunteer work within, uh, first at the, at the high school, uh, at the Evanston Township High School. And then um, when I finished my PhD, I went to volunteer for uh, a battered women's program. It just happened that it was very close to my office, and that was why I decided to do it. No sort of uh, great um, insight into why I wanted to do it. Uh, I, I knew I wanted to do some volunteering, and so that was close, it was convenient, and that's why I did it. But around that time, I read an article in the newspaper about uh, a, a <coughs> South Asian woman who had started a, a nonprofit to serve, or a group of South Asian women who had start, started an organization to serve immigrant battered women and their children. And so I'm like, well, I'm already volunteering at, at, a, at, uh, at an organization doing this work. I need to find a way to give back 
to my community. And so I started volunteering at this organization called Apnaghar, which means our home. Um, and I'd volunteered there for nearly 10 years before I got this call um, from one of the founders of the organization saying, so Jata, there's this job opening uh, for either a program director or an executive director, and I'd love for you to apply. And I'd only been a volunteer there. Of course, I'd volunteered over the years in practically every part of that organization. But volunteering at a place and working at a place is quite different, right? Um, anyway, so since I was in this situation with this manufacturing job that was paying me a great deal of money, was had <coughs> nice bonuses every year. Um, I, I worked with really very, very smart folks. But I was in a very, um, I was asked to do a very narrow job. I had, uh, and then I told you that I like to do many different things. And, and so that, so I was feeling a little constrained. And when <coughs> Kantaji called me up and said, Sujata, apply for this job. I mentioned it to my husband, and he's like, yes, you should apply. We don't need the money. <laughs> and famous last words, right? <laughs> um, well, it, you know, I, we don't have an extravagant lifestyle. We, we didn't have any, neither of us had any student loans because, because we both had our educations for the most part in our home countries, so that wasn't an issue. <coughs> um, and, and so... It was possible. Uh, I, we don't have children, so we don't have children's education to consider. So truly, we were in a situation where I could, and, and he has a position that, he, you know, he, he's also an he is an academic, um, so he has, to <laughs> so he, he has a fairly secure job. So all of these things, I, I say this to sort of give you a sense of the considerations mm -hmm. Uh, when I look at the transition that I made. Uh, so I did end up doing, uh, I, I was the executive director of Apnagar for nearly five years. It, uh, I was there because they, the organization needed uh, to turn around. Uh, they, they were in <coughs> some trouble and needed to turn around. Um, while I was at the cement factory, the cement factory paid for me to get an MBA. So, so this this was my opportunity at Apnagar to um, to use my skills, my management skills, if you will, to turn around this company. the The budget was virtually the same as the budget of the department that I was running at the dental instruments company, so it wasn't a big deal, a big difference. But now I was working with real people as opposed to inanimate objects. <laughs> big difference, big, big difference. And I was, I, and, I, and, and you can imagine, I came from a, a field of primarily male-dominated uh, industries to now working with almost all women. Also, a very big change for me. So, uh, so a whole uh, uh, culture shift, if you will, for me. Uh, so, so I did end up working, uh, you know, doing what the organization expected of me in terms of growing the organization into an institution in the community, but it became one of the most transformative experiences of my life. It, it truly uh, changed me in, in ways that I would never have imagined. I had, um, I met women who had been battered and bruised, bones broken, wives of diplomats, uh, doctors um, who were so badly beaten but yet held hope that they would raise good children. These young children that I saw in our shelter were truly amazing. They, um, the, their mothers wanted them to be good and to learn and they would help. So when we brought groceries into the shelter, these young children would help us carry them in. So truly amazing, amazing experience for, for me. Um, so five years is a very long time to go back and do engineering or science. So I continue to do the work I do. Um, I've had several jobs in nonprofits. Uh, after Apnagar, I went to work on a, on a very large project uh, 
It was the plan, the Chicago's plan to end homelessness. I didn't last there very long. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. Uh, so, so going from a very transformative experience to a terrible experience. Um, yet, in in my in my work on 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 that project on the plan to end homelessness, while it it was it was not the job for me, I made a lot of contacts, and those contacts serve me to to this day. Um, I left with my reputation and my integrity intact. Um, and I think that was a learning lesson for me. Um, I, from there, I, I worked. Um, I, ha I, I did a small stint at at, a, at a, an organization that develops supportive housing for folks who are chronically homeless. So people who have been homeless for a really long time. Uh, and it was it was an amazing opportunity to work on h new housing developments that really nurtured people's souls and spirits to while they were trying to get out of uh, addiction and and out of you know deep deep rooted poverty um, I had an opportunity to work with a number of different groups. The way the, the, way the, the housing developer worked was they <coughs> always worked with a community partner, so had the opportunity to work with a community partner to bring services into the housing development. Um, and then I saw a position open at a foundation. It's called the Eleanor Foundation. Uh, it was a 100-year-old organization that had transformed itself into a foundation to serve uh, low-income working women, uh, to help low-income working women become economically self-sufficient. And so here is, I think, um, again, a, an, a, an opportunity for me to, to ultimately, what, what I care about, I, I've, as I've learned in, after all this time, is that I really want women to have the economic equality that they deserve and because they can change they can change not only their own lives and their families lives but they can change communities so that's sort of the premise of the Eleanor Foundation so I was there worked there as the director of programs for several years and then um, sort of applied for the position that I'm in I've been in for about five and a half years um, the foundation sort of has a the the Chicago Foundation for Women has a slightly broader scope than the Eleanor Foundation. Um, we we support um, organizations. We support organizations that are working on the issues of um, <coughs> access to health and health uh, information, freedom from violence, and women's economic security. So this brings together all of my past work, uh, and I'll tell you more about the foundation. How oh, awesome! Hi, I'm Cheryl Hughes. Uh, first, I apologize for being late. It's not my typical MO. And for also not being in business attire. Today, our management team is going to a Cubs game. So, <laughs> dressed for the box. Um, so, uh, I um, my background is very different, um, which is what makes these sessions so interesting. I come from a family of blue collar workers and um, some of them are Trump supporters. <laughs> so um, I, um, my, my people are from uh, southeast Iowa, which is uh, down near the Mississippi where it touches uh, Missouri, Missouri, Missouri. I can't, I can't even pronounce how they, uh, and my parents in their 20s um, had an opportunity to move to Aspen, Colorado, uh, where my father was a linotypist for the Aspen Times. And I spent the first seven years of my life in Aspen. <coughs> Uh, living in a two-bedroom trailer that I'm sure is worth close to a million dollars now. Um, it was a, an incredible, incredible experience to have those formative years in such a magical place. 
um, I met I I have fond memories. I fond, I got, actually got to go to the Aspen Ideas Festival last summer, and I was to had one of the Divi bikes was riding it around, and every morning I realized I was riding my bike past my elementary school, and I remember so clearly every morning my mother dropping me off at the Aspen Times and my father would walk me to school and I got to walk to the Aspen Times from kindergarten and first grade by myself and it seemed like a giant journey and I now realize it was really two short half blocks um, <laughs> around a corner but um, so <clears throat> magical place to <coughs> Ohio, um, to a small town in Ohio, southwest uh, Ohio, clo uh, just um, about an hour or two from Cincinnati. And uh, so I, I grew up in a place called Greenville, Ohio, home of Annie Oakley. Mm -hmm. And the Treaty of Greenville, which was signed in the uh, early 19th century or late 18th century, Tecumseh ending all the wars east of the Mississippi. And, um, and really, so not much has happened or come out of Greenville since the 19th century. Um, and it was um, a very uh, blue collar factory town and farmers. And it was that, like that, that, so coming from like this amazing place to Greenville, I just, I, I never fit in, ever. And um, I, I grew up in a, a place where women um, were taught to be secretaries or bank tellers. So in my, I wasn't considered a particularly smart girl. So, and um, so I was told to take secretarial classes, typing classes, and um, focus on maybe if I was lucky, I'd be a secretary, not so lucky I'd be a bank teller, or, or I could just be a stay-at-home mom mar married to like a middle manager at the factory. And if I really wanted to escape, I could go into the military. Those were my choices. And uh, I instead decided to go to college, which was a shock to everyone. But luckily at the time, because this was the late 70s, so we were still a government that funded education at that point. Um, if you were a high school graduate, you were of Ohio, an Ohio high school, you would automatically be accepted at Ohio State. So I went to Ohio State, um, m again, much to the surprise of everyone. <laughs> And um, you like I'm I'm not uh, it's interesting I'm not academically inclined but I have a master's from University of Chicago and spent some time at Harvard but you just would <laughs> never have known that from my early years. Um, but when I when I got to Ohio State, as I remember at one point somebody asking me when I was senior in high school, what did you want to do, Cheryl? And I just had this like idea of like big events, some like cultural stuff. I didn't, you know, maybe public relations. I really couldn't, but you know, like I didn't know, like my world was not big enough to like express what I wanted to do. And so the only thing I could think of was, well, I want to be like Don Kirshner and produce <laughs> rock concerts. You guys may actually remember that name. I, I don't expect you guys to. Um, and Somebody, my a friend's father heard me say that. He's like, that is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> you need to have a practical dream. <laughs> Sounds you need, Yeah, you need to either be a secretary or maybe an accountant. Um, you know, since you are going to college, maybe you can go beyond being a secretary. Um, I create large, large productions. 
that have an impact <coughs> on this region. And, uh, or I hope, have an impact on this region. Um, after, you know, my, my time at Ohio State, I, I just, I started, like, to doing whatever I could to get whatever experience I could. When I graduated from college, I had a four-page resume, right? Like, I would, I did lots of internships. I... I, I was a, uh, a work-study employee, so I worked for the athletic department at Ohio State, which was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I taught weightlifting um, to my fellow students, mm -hmm. but I was just constantly doing things and exploring classes, and, um, you know, I just knew that I wanted to kind of work in this art thing, kind of, maybe. Maybe sports, maybe arts, but it had to be big. And I still couldn't put my um, finger on what it was I wanted to do. And um, I worked for an art gallery and my background was very helpful um, when this, uh, the woman's name was Spangler Cummings. <laughs> Spangler, I was waiting tables. They, I just have to tell you, I made a living waiting tables for a decade before I made money doing what I do. It's almost like acting, right? Like I was always running from one gig to another, but waiting tables paid my bills. And so I was waiting tables at this little restaurant in this neighborhood in, Chico in Columbus called the Short North, which is a very hip neighborhood now. But when I was coming up, it was not I mean, where all the artists lived, but it was um, not, not hadn't been gentrified. And it's a neighborhood that sits between the Ohio State University campus and downtown Columbus. So eventually it was going to be gentrified. So I'm waiting tables at this little restaurant, and this woman used to come in. She had this long, curly hair, <coughs> just, you know, she would just fly into the place. And every day, I would wait on her, and she would say, what day is it, and what time is it? And I'm like, and this woman owns a business. She owned a gallery down the street. And so finally, I said, do you need any help? She said, oh, my God. You have no idea how much help I need. And I'm like, you know, I wait tables in the morning. I've got plenty of time in the afternoon. Like, what do I need, you know? And so I started volunteering for Spangler. And I showed up in a suit and my five-page resume. And she's like, no one's ever worn a suit around me before or shown me, oh, my God. And so the next thing I knew, I was selling art and I was producing art events in the short north. I was producing art festivals. We started this thing called the uh, Gallery Hop, which happened still the first um, Sunday in um, the first Saturday of the month. It's been going on for 25 years. It's he you're from Columbus? Yeah. Yeah, so you, anybody else from Columbus? Yeah, so you guys know what I'm talking about. And then I, I worked on, um, um, I wasn't the creator, but I was one of the original committee members of a parade that's giant, the Duda Parade. Does anybody know what a Duda Parade is? It, uh, they started it in Pasadena as the anti-Rose Bowl Parade, and it's basically a parade that starts backwards, so it starts with the uh, street cleaners cleaning the streets and ends with uh, a police car with people in the trunk but it's filled um, the parade is just it's you know it's it's turning the world upside down it's topsy-turvy it's um, you know there's the briefcase brigade there's always the marching flamingos folks I mean it's a riot and so for the short north this became the signature and after a few years of doing this so I was 25, I knew lots of people in town. I could have had an amazing career in Columbus, but people kept talking about 
how they'd gone to Europe or they'd been to this place or they'd been to that place. And I'm like, hey, I have not left Ohio since Colorado. I got to change this. So I moved to Chicago after having visited here twice. I moved to Chicago with no job. I knew two people and I didn't have a place to live and I had a thousand dollars. This is 1987. And a friend of mine was driving here, so I got a ride, and he dropped me at the Lawson YMCA, um, which is <laughs> just, just down the street. Um, which, you know, in Ohio, Y's are really good, wholesome places. <laughs> um, and I walk into the Y, which is, um, <laughs> it's single room <laughs> occupancy. Um, and tourist. It was this like it was this international hostel, long-term drug rehab, um, people who had no other home. And uh, I had a gym bag, a garment bag, and a, a laundry basket of clothes. That was it. And a thousand dollars to my name. And my third day here, I saw a gentleman commit suicide. So that was uh, quite, it was not Ohio. It was not Columbus. But I was determined to like chase that dream of what is it that I wanted, like yeah, I wanted, it had to be big, right? So I started waiting tables again. And you know, you mentioned um, that meeting people and the connections and the networks. Like my life has just been one connection after another of people who have brought me to the next place. Um, because what I do for a living doesn't have this linear track, right? There is no degree for it. There is, you know, I can I can tell people what I do with in less than a paragraph. So. I meet someone, I'm waiting tables at a fancy French restaurant and suddenly this woman appears, new waitress, I'm, and she asks me what I want to do and I'm like, yeah, I just want to work in the arts and I want to do these big festivals and these big things and she said, well, you need to um, meet a woman named Jane Alexandrov who was running this international program at Columbia College. Oh, this woman was working on her master's <coughs> degree in journalism. And the arts was her beat. I never saw that woman again. She never came back to work. I knew her one day. Or at least that's what my memory tells me. She may have been there a week. And, and I called Jane Alexandrov and said, hi, my name is Cheryl Hughes. Somebody gave me your name. I think I want to work in the arts. Can you give me an informational interview? And she said, yes. And so for those of you in the room who've ever asked anyone for an informational interview, particularly women, it is your responsibility as you go forward to say yes when other women ask you for an informational interview. Mm -hmm. As much as, I probably give 50 or 60 a year. Um, I went to that interview, she gave me three names. Those three names connected my career for the next 15 years. She gave me Helen Doria, mm -hmm. um, Tom Blackman, and I'm just trying to think of the third, was um, a woman who ran the, uh, uh, Sandy Royster who worked at the time at the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, and through that, I got uh, a six-month internship at the Department of Cultural Affairs at the age of 26, so it was really pre-labor. Um, they paid me $500 every three months, so I made $1,000. It was basically train fare. And I went to work for the Department of, it was called the Office of Fine Arts at that point, and now it's called the um, DK's, Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. And I, I created public programs. 
And when I was there, I went on 50 informational interviews because everybody takes a call when it's from the city, or at least they used to. <laughs> um, and people met with me. And that led to a job doing the Printer's Row Book Fair that led to a job doing the Printer's Row Photo Fair. And then I went to talk to Tom Blackman. I eventually ended up working on the art uh, festival that is, you know, three versions of it ago. And uh, then Helen Doria connected me to someplace else. All of those jobs eventually led me to an informational interview. <coughs> and so I, I, was, I would spend, I was making money, making my living waiting tables. And then I was with my little briefcase on the train every day going to all these different gigs, right? The Dance Center Columbia College producing a dance festival. Then I go across town and work for the Printers Row Book Fair. I did a study of performing spaces for the region. I mean, it was, I was just everywhere. And then I got an informational interview with a woman named Lois Weisberg. <laughs> and uh, to have anybody here know who Lois, we have you heard of Lois? We yes. I know you guys have. <laughs> <laughs> anybody here heard of Lois Weisberg? <laughs> They dropped her name at another place that we were at. Yeah. The cultural so, center. Yeah. 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 So if you get a chance, um, there's a fabulous New Yorker article written by Malcolm Gladwell. So if you go to malcolmgladwell.com, it's a ar great article on Lois. I think it was titled, Who Really Wants the World? A Little Jewish Grandmother on the North Side of Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> it's a great article. What then led Malcolm to write, about the connectors in um, his first major book that I just forgot the name of. Tipping, Tipping Point. Tipping Point. So I went in to see Lois, um, and at the time she smoked, she, she, gosh, she must have been like 65 at this point, maybe 60. She's just walking up the stairs, smoking a cigarette, and she's like got on this crazy outfit. She's like, you must be waiting for me. And I'm terrified, you know, like, oh, my God, like, this woman is amazing. And this was before we had the cultural center. They used to have this building across the street from City Hall. And she said, she, she's like, I like your resume. And, it, you know, I had a bunch of odd jobs. And she's like, I think I have, tell me about yourself. And I went to, told her a few things. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so said, I think I have a job for you. This is three minutes into our conversation. Um, I have got a job for you. There's this block over there. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, check. it's block 37. Infin infamous block, right? Like big empty lot in the middle of the city. And uh, she said, uh, we're going to put kids to work there this summer. And I went to speak like I knew it, you know, like when I'm impressed, just, <coughs> don't bother. It doesn't exist yet. So I started the next day. And uh, that project was called Gallery 37. And it's now After School Matters. So I was the first director of Gallery 37, and I did that for eight years. And when I started, there was one full-time staff, me, and we had a $300,000 budget, and we employed 260 kids in the summer and about 50 professional artists. And when I left eight years later, we were employing um, 400 artists a year, had a staff of 25 people. The program had been replicated in 20 cities around the world, and we had a building, and we were almost in every high school. It was insane. <clears throat> and um, from there, I was um, sent. Um, Lois asked me to go to the mayor's office of special events to work with a colleague of mine who had just been pro uh, promoted to executive director of special events. They used to be separate, now they're one department. And uh, for a decade I designed festivals for the city. Um, so, too nu numerous, so I just designed lots and lots of festivals <coughs> and someday I can tell you all about those festivals. 
Um, and then um, after about 10 years, I got a call from the Museum of Science and Industry. The MacArthur Foundation had this great idea for <coughs> a science, a year of science. And, 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 and this is a, an, it was called, at that point it was called the year of science. And there was this job description floating around and I read it and I said, they need me. But I'm not going to leave the city. I'm they at, sure did need you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to leave the city. I'm at 17 years in. I'm going to get my 20 year pension. And then I got a <coughs> phone call from somebody. She's like, I, uh, this job, I think it's you. And then I got a call from my mentor, Donna LaPietra, who's a film producer in Chicago, and she's like, this job. And I'm like, no, no, no. And I kept recommending people for it. And then this woman named Jimmy Philippi came to special events for, with my boss and I to ask us who we <coughs> thought. And I was like, they need me. And then I had a really, really terrible couple of weeks that showed me I needed to leave. Right? Like, I had to believe that everything was going to be okay if I left this confines of the city. And um, I went to the Museum of Science and Industry, and we're, I worked very closely with Elspeth on creating a year of uh, a public awareness and public engagement program on science. And I'm so proud of that program. 300,000 people participated in science programming that year. Um, and after that project ended, um, I was finishing up my, oh, and I forgot to, in the middle of all of that, I got this fellowship to Harvard to, um, at the School of uh, Urban Planning and architecture, um, the GSD, and I spent a year studying the theory of urban ephemera and temporary urbanism. <laughs> which I love, um, which is really how we transform our spaces with sanctioned and un unsanctioned stuff, you know, like, and so ephemeral public art, the transformations, like, that just, I just love that. Oh, I just love that stuff. Um, I have a whole bookshelf of books about, you know, the theory of public space and culture and <coughs> ephemeral art and anyway, I could go on. Um, and, and so I decided after that I wanted to teach at a university and so I, I got my master's degree at U of C in in uh, cultural policy and social sciences and um, wrote a thesis on the 50 largest, the cultural affairs departments of the 50 largest cities in the US. <laughs> well, it took me nine months to write that thing. <laughs> Luckily I was in between jobs. Um, and I, I mapped and benchmarked how Department of Cultural Affairs um, <coughs> function in the 50 largest cities and then overlaid that data with Richard Florida's status on creative cities. And so what I can tell you is, if a city has a government arts and culture program, they're more likely to be higher on the cultural affair, um, uh, the creative cities. If they have a nonprofit, they're gonna be lower. And if they don't have public art, which is the second thing that, mo second most popular thing that cultural affairs do, then they're really in a dying city. So like if there's no art and a no <coughs> government piece in it, it's just not good. So anyway, that then brought me to um, the Chicago Community Trust where I currently create large programming that I'll talk to you guys about later. So that's my story. So I thought we could just start with your questions to kind of drive this session, this part of the session. So, um, and then we can kind of get into some of the nitty gritty. But so let's, who has questions at this point? Well, here go the hands. <laughs> yeah. Um, I see. Can we get the whole bunch and then we'll, yeah, that's fine. 
Um, do you have a whole bunch of questions in your intro? I'm sure. sure. We can do that that way. Yeah. That's fine. Mine's a very basic question. Um, I see, I see uh, job postings a lot of the time for program officer, program director, program manager, and I don't know what that job is, and I would like to know what that job is. Okay. Yeah. Um, Feel free to combine with some people's questions. Sophia, what was your question? Um, okay, uh, so I really admire all the work that you do. Um, I'm, I really want to shift from academia to advocacy work. And I guess I'm, I see that the common theme I see is that you shifted between many different things. I'm interested in how you create a coherent narrative between them uh, to to, I don't know, I don't know, maybe to uh, put it all together to show what you've accomplished for <coughs> where you're trying to go next, maybe. For all, any of us. Yeah. 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 I, and that was... Uh, Elspeth, um, I, I was so struck by your work, um, especially in the public sector moving into foundations. I worked at the South Carolina Arts Commission and was their director of folk life and traditional arts, and a big concern that I had in my program was that um, the communities with whom I was working uh, wouldn't receive money because the budget that I was given often went to universities and larger organizations. So I, my larger question is about uh, addressing equity, and um, especially with the Ford Foundation making this very large shift, how is that affecting the larger field when foundations are just so, each one is so different? Our foundation just made a giant shift as well. So maybe we should stop there because yeah. Yeah. Now, the, now the questions are, <laughs> um, are sort of... <coughs> okay, I wouldn't mind hearing a couple more. Let's yeah. take Evan and Lizzie and then we'll, we'll do another round. So Evan, go ahead. I have to, I have to write down these questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing them down here. I got them. You're So thank you all again for being here and for your time. Um, I mean, I, I can only speak from my own experience, but just from conversations, I know other people in the room share this as well. But I mean, I've had some experience in the university doing like being a grant review board and like you know public program conference and that sort of thing but other than that I haven't really had very many concrete experiences that at least to my mind would translate um, and transfer to to the work that you all do and so I'm just wondering if you might recommend some um, opportunities that we might locate in the university or, or specific volunteer work that we might try to do outside of the academy um, that might make us better prepared to, to find jobs in, in the program work and the foundational work. Yeah, Lizzie? Um, yeah, my question is, like how far does being really passionate about the cause of the organization that you're interested in um, joining get you <laughs> and 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 like being a smart and capable person versus concrete specialized experience if you're if you're at you know a, our stage where I'm, I'm also interested in transitioning from academia into this kind of work um, with with I guess limited direct experience some but limited and so how far does does that kind of, you know, the genuine interest get you? And what skills would you be looking for for an entry level position? So that's a few. Let's start with like, what are the jobs? And I think that would allow us to address the skills, the skills. experience. So how's that? Okay, um, shall I just mm -hmm. take start a few minutes to start? Okay, um, um, I'm gonna try to be a model of brevity here. <laughs> uh, but, but I do wanna say, make a, uh, one contextual comment before, you know, before going to the questions. And that is that the, the foundation world is made up of a lot of really different kinds of organizations. So the mm -hmm. MacArthur Foundation, 6.2, last I looked, billion dollars, gives away $250 million a year uh, all over the world. Um, um, the Ch Chicago Community Trust, local community foundation, takes gifts and donations from people locally, hands them out for a lot of really specific, geographically specific uh, work. Um, the Chicago Foundation for Women, I mean, I'm speaking for them, and they can speak <laughs> much better for themselves, uh, but supports a particular set of causes and needs. Um, so, uh, and then if you look kind of across the country, you, you know, you will find um, large foundations like MacArthur, you'll find medium-sized foundations 
uh, like the one that's supporting this this program, uh, but works <coughs> nationally. You'll find a, a growing number of wealthy individuals and their foundations and their um, and their kind of offices that that do grant making. Everybody has a different approach, and um, so it's really hard to get a sense of the field. The field. To me, the field is more the field of nonprofits, and I've always viewed foundations as the financing arm of the nonprofit mm -hmm. world. My colleagues in the big foundations do not agree with that, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I should just tell you that don't use that. Uh, with anybody. Uh, just keep keep it in the back of your mind. So, to that said, what is a po program officer job about? It really depends on where you are, but generally speaking. Uh, for what you all should know is that uh, the big foundations like to uh, hire program officers who are of the field in which they will be working. So whether it's <coughs> uh, you know whether it's international relations or um, um, I don't know we had a Russian expert at MacArthur. You know people the big foundations will hire from the fields. Um, Smaller foundations may well hire people like you all who can quickly learn a field. That was me at MacArthur all the time, over and over and over again. I had to quickly learn a field. I had to learn who the players were. I had to learn who the, you know, what the issues were, what the opportunities were. I had to do that, and I had to do it pretty quickly. And then I had to make judgments about people and organizations. So the knowledge and skill base kind of depends on where you're going and what the job is. Um, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things that you all are really well prepared for uh, that foundations need. Uh, one is writing. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. never had a job that didn't require good writing skills. Really, really important. Um, listening, absorbing, and analyzing information, uh, accessing data, all really important. I didn't do research of the kind of data sort, but more and more there is a thrust within the field uh, to have people who can do a that data uh, driven evaluation. And uh, if that's been part of your background, that's helpful. Storytelling. Mm -hmm. I heard a number of you uh, uh, have knowledge and experience and background in that. Boy, you know, it's like writing, it's become something that everybody has to do. Um, so, um, some foundations do not do not look uh, positively on advocacy and advocates. Some do. So I'm going to turn it over to you to comment on some of these things. And are there other positions you think are relevant to this group here? So we've talked a little bit about program officer. What else? Like communication or development? Great. Um, library. And by the way, foundations, big ones have libraries. They have art collections. Uh, they, you know, they have evaluation offices. They have uh, public uh, affairs offices. These are all things that you can find in a big foundation. So uh, Chicago Foundation for Women is tiny in the scheme of these two foundations, right? Uh, we are local. We are also specific in terms of population um, <coughs> we serve. Uh, having, having said that, uh, we we all, we raise money like like the trust. We raise money that then goes back out in the community. Um, so we have a development office that's made up of several people, and we also have a programs team that is. And we do two things in our program team. <coughs> One is this job of a program officer, and uh, our program <coughs> officers are general. And so the, the big skills, you know, as, as one of our former board members said, is you have to be curious and ask the good questions. Uh, you have to listen, as Elspeth said, and you have to be able to write, to analyze and write. And that, I think, you know, the big thing in the humanities, you can read a lot of materials and then be able to synthesize it to, to have the main, and to be persuasive, because ultimately you have to persuade your board or your grant making committee to to make the grant um, so the so that's one piece the the program officer piece uh, at the foundation um, our programs team does a couple more things 
We, we also offer training and technical assistance to the organizations we support. We tend to support small and medium-sized organizations. So, um, so it's, we feel it's a great responsibility to help those organizations be strong, sustainable, and <coughs> grow over time. So we offer trainings in the area of organizational development primarily. So fundraising, financial management, governance, and communications. Um, so those are sort of the areas that we mainly offer. As Elspeth said, we fund advocacy as well. So we fund both organizing work in communities. We also fund leadership development of women leaders, as well as policy work. So the, the range of advocacy uh, initiatives. Uh, and so we feel, you know, as a small foundation, you know, we could easily give all of our money to direct services and never get anywhere. But if we fund advocacy, the way we see it is um, that you're not changing just one life at a time, you're able to change many lives at, at a time. And so we, we, therefore we also feel it's important for the organizations that we support, whether they be advocacy organizations or direct service organizations, to know something about advocacy. So we, we do what's called uh, an advocacy academy, uh, which runs about seven months and which is really a, a course uh, that, that we offer our grantees. Uh, the other side, um, the the other thing that one of our uh, that that our work is also involves is we, we really believe that every woman can be a philanthropist, mm -hmm. and so uh, for that reason we want to be sure that everybody has an opportunity to participate in philanthropy. We we have a number of what we call giving councils um, and giving circles <coughs> where women all <coughs> pool their money. It ranges with the Young Women's Giving Council from $40 a year to $2,500 for the women, the, the North Shore Giving Circle. So it's a range. Um, those giving councils and giving circles are supported by another kind of program officer. We call her the philanthropic education officer. So she manages those giving councils and giving circles, but she excuse also... Excuse me, can I just interject? As I was thinking about giving circles, too, and just to yeah. make sure people understand, giving circles aren't only women. Oh, the, they <laughs> aren't only so women. Ours uh, happen to be. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there are a variety of giving circles. I, for instance, belong to an Asian giving circle that's made up of Asians giving back to the Asian community. At the trust? At the trust. Um, but the... So, so the other part of her job is also about doing this philanthropic training. And one of the pieces that we do is called board member boot camp or a series of boot camps for those who are interested in becoming nonprofit board members. Um, so, so it's really a variety of jobs. We have a communications manager. Um, so uh, we put a lot of materials out in the public space. We write a, a blog for the Huffington Post. We, we try and get stories printed in the newspaper about the issues that concern our grantees and ourselves. So we do have a communications manager who is really involved in not only writing those stories, but also sourcing the stories as well as placing them in, in the media. We have a very, you know, part of her job is very being very active on social media uh, as, as well. So. Uh, that's another th that's another kind of job. Our development team is made up of uh, you know folks that do s events, special events. We do a very one very large event among other events that brings together about two thousand people uh, for a lunch, which is one of our big fundraising events. Um, as well as somebody, we also have major gifts officers. So um, and and as does the trust where we work with you know large donors to help them uh, <coughs> and inspire them make their gifts to the causes that are near and dear to them and therefore near and dear to us as well mm -hmm. um, so those are really the main and we have of course a, a finance arm as well so those are sort of the three main areas 
Sharon, can I have you, if you're not going to add other jobs, talk about this other question? I thought we could move to this, like the, the, the pipeline into a foundation, because I don't know that necessarily everyone comes in as a program officer. Yeah, but how I, I certainly actually? did. But I, I just want to talk about what a community foundation is Yeah, yeah. Um, before. So MacArthur's private foundation, they have one source of money. They can't really take money in easily without lots of tax implications. But they can, but nobody wants to give it to them. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, Buffett gave money to Gates. Gates, but that's so. it. <laughs> so a community foundation, ex they exist all over the world. I would imagine every community that you guys are from has a community foundation. It's a very specific type of public <coughs> charity. So just, I really just want to, our industry, the community foundation, is shifting radically. <coughs> when my CEO took over the Chicago Community Foundation in 2002, 99% of our grant making came from our endowment. So we're, we currently are about $2.3 billion. So our endowment gives away about $40 million a year. That's what we call our discretionary funds. And 1% came from donor advice funds. So those are individual families, philanthropists, community corporations that have uh, this taxing vehicle called a donor advice fund. Today <laughs> at the trust, 83% of our grant making dollars come from donor advised funds. Wow. And less than 20% come from our endowment. So we gave away at the trust last year $200 million in this region. The majority of that is coming from individual donors who have a donor advised fund. So this part of the industry is changing. That where a century ago when the community foundation or even 25 years ago the program officer was really determining how money was being distributed more and more and more individual donors are making their own decisions because there's so much more information so I just wanted to kind of talk about like how that's changing in the world of community philanthropy and do the, Good. do the program officers work with those individual donors then? Is that Only if the donors them? ask. So otherwise you're just executing what the donor said. I want to fund mm -hmm. X, Y, Z. And, and they're very sophisticated, <coughs> right? These individuals are very, very sophisticated in how they want their philanthropy to be distributed. So the community foundation at the, tr the trust, as we we've see our plan, our role we are three we have three parts we um, <coughs> for us we are about civic engagement which is what I had up at the foundation inspiring philanthropy so our vision or goal in that sector which came out of our centennial work which is something that I managed we turned a hundred to a year ago um, is we inspire philanthropy so we believe everyone's a philanthropist and that we want Chicago to be the most philanthropic region in the nation and that's broadly it doesn't have to come through the trust you know that's broadly and we did a study that you can read online um, givingchicago.com that actually talked looked at giving in this region and we are we have a higher giving rate than the nation. And the third is our civic <coughs> engagement space, which is very new to our foundation, which is about um, giving voice to residents throughout what we're doing um, in our work. So, so go ahead. Civic engagement inspired philanthropy, what was the third? Leading <coughs> change. And leading oh. change is where we we have focused on certain programmatic areas so this is where a lot of the program officers reside but their role becomes convener bringing together cohort funding cohorts um, because we can't do this singularly any longer like a single institution cannot solve all the problems like we have to have shared resources and work towards 
um, solutions together. Um, so I am a part of civic engagement and the marketing. So I actually <coughs> have a role as a program officer as well as my civic engagement role. In our development space, we have, what, eight what we call identity-based funds or giving circles. Um, we also manage three or four community foundations in the region. But in our communication space around um, storytelling, we changed our website last year to from being a pushing out information like what we want to tell you not necessarily what you're looking for website to flipping around around uh, the customer experience and our website now is completely content based so we are a publisher of content daily <coughs> Go ahead. Could I? Uh, I'd like to take up the equity question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I because uh, I definitely would want to get there as well. But go ahead. So, um, two three years ago, we did a project at the trust called On the Table, where for our 99th anniversary, we ask everyone to tell us how Chicago, how we could be a more dynamic and vibrant community. And it was the first time we'd ever asked the community. And they came back to us, 12,000 people participated. And the number three, one of the top things they said is we need to have more, uh, we need to address our segregation and we have to be a more inclusive community and we have to deal with race. And so that was happening at our strategic plan. And now race and equity is at the center of everything that we're doing at the trust. So, just uh, so okay, I, now that you said okay. that, I have to ask you, what do you mean by it's at the center? I, I mean, is it is it a top grant making criterion? <laughs> well, it's not, it's not just grant making. So in, in all of the grant making areas, race and equity, our public programming area is around race and equity. And we also are beginning to, um, to give small grants <coughs> out for um, inspiring philanthropy around fundraising. So it becomes the lens of all of our work. Um, I guess I would have had a more, much more pessimistic uh, response <laughs> to, your, <laughs> to, your, uh, you know, to your comment question. I, I you know, uh, uh, foundations, the one, you know, the, the kind I worked for for all those years, are made up of elites mm -hmm. and um, just like as in your experience and while I don't think the problem is giving money to universities or big think tanks versus um, versus uh, more local and community based uh, work overall I don't think that's particularly a problem it may have been in your you know I don't doubt that was in your ag agency but um, I, I think that, uh, you know, th that thinking about equity or racial equity in particular as a real shift in power dynamics is not going to be driven by foundations uh, because they are, you know, they're the people who made the money and the people who made the money, you know, are at the top of the power, you know, pyramid. So um, there's certainly there are, there's lots of good philanthropy that will contribute to increasing equity. I'm sure that what the community trust is doing does. I, I absolutely know that the Chicago Foundation for <coughs> Women, um, you know, helps in that regard. Uh, but in terms of, you know, especially the big national, international foundations like Ford, right. even though they've announced, you know, a different right. point of view, actually doing something that will change power dynamics in our society, I'm, I'm pessimistic. Is that going on the website? <laughs> 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 Hope not. We are taping. <laughs> um, do people have follow-up questions about what are the jobs and or this question of equity? Um, uh, just a, a quick little question. On Friday, we heard from um, Angel. I don't know. It's a good He said that um, getting 
program officer jobs in foundations, it's like one of the hardest. There, there are very few of them. It's a very <laughs> close-knit world. So, I don't know. Uh, yeah, more to that? absolutely. So, uh, if you don't mind, uh, absolutely. It's changing a little bit now. Um, because I, I do a little, I'm part of a faculty that does training for, for new grant makers, but, uh, and I see a lot of new faces. But when, when, certainly when I started as a program officer, it was because somebody took a chance on me. But typically, those jobs are highly prized. And they, people go from foundation to foundation, or once they get in a foundation, people last 10, 12, 15 years. 40. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, there are some foundations. Uh, there are some foundations where people last because it, it is it is truly uh, a very privileged job. <coughs> it is it is uh, it was the only job that I had where I had the luxury of being able to read a lot, to understand a lot, to you know. Whereas when I worked on the other side, I never had the kind of time. I currently don't have that kind of time, but. But certainly, it's a very, very privileged job. So the no reason that people are gonna uh, some people give get up. them. Some people do get those jobs. Uh, yeah, know. it's changing a so, little bit. Yeah. Uh, but I don't. I, I I think they are very hard to get. And they, you know, at least in my experience, you don't get a program officer job by going through a an education program in philanthropy. Mm -mm. You mm -hmm. get it because you happen to be the person with the knowledge that that foundation wants. <coughs> it gets connected at the right time, um, and um, so I, I I sometimes wonder what happens to all those graduates of the philanthropy programs because I, I don't see them funneling people into foundations. Um, yeah, they're very privileged jobs, uh, but I, I also want to say something else about that about that, and that is there is a privilege and it's a responsibility to hold a job like that. But you also really have to understand, and I said it earlier, I'm going to say it again because I think it's so yeah. worth repeating, that you're helping other people do their work when you're a program officer. You're not doing your own. And so, um, or that's how I think it should work. Uh, and, and usually, you know, yes. usually it does. So I went from a really activist kind of a job to a program officer job, and, you know, I had to kind of bite my tongue a lot. So I didn't tell people what, how they should be doing their work. Um, and so <coughs> while there, you know, you get the, you get the luxury of, of working on really mission-based work, of having resources, not having to go out and hustle them, you know, when you're in a program officer position, um, um, what you don't get is to follow your own direction, your own personal direction. I, I just think that's such an important point, yep. a really, really important point. Um, it's not the program officer's money, right? right. They're Nor is it the president's money. Yeah, nor, right? It's, 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 it's a public trust. There, it's a public trust. I mean, at a community foundation, it's about donor intent. And we have so, so, so many donors, and so we have lots of endowments that we fund like we have one fund around curling right like where we're always looking for programs around curling <laughs> or mind. yeah there's <laughs> or um, I mean, you has a passion for yeah, curling yeah. nowhere to get support so but but it, it 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 even even within the foundation there's constantly a language check when people are like well I'm going to no. You're you're here to represent that donor, um, and that we're making <coughs> the best choices for with that with those philanthropic dollars. There, so I just want to. There's something else that people don't understand, and I I had a very disconcerting lesson in how people didn't understand this early in my career, which I won't go into. But um, w program officer will start out. Uh, generally speaking, will either work on developing the guideline strategy or or absorb them and know that that's their job is to carry them out. But then, when they start to work with potential grantees, they'll work with them often in a rather critical way. Mm -hmm. of, of, you know, they'll be asking tough questions. They'll be asking for more information. They'll be, you know, go, you know, poking into those dark corners of the organization that 
you know mm -hmm. that the that the uh, applicant maybe would prefer not to be to have <laughs> come to light but then once they decide that they are going to recommend a grant then they become the advocates mm -hmm. internal advocates for that organization or mm -hmm. for that grant um, and um, and they are not the deciders they have to advocate with a with a decision making process or and body which is different in every in every in different places but this is something that i had a very sophisticated head of a national organization just rake me over the coals once for not getting him the million dollar grant he wanted getting him only you know only seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars <laughs> as early in my career and i had known him before he was somebody i had worked with in my prior jobs and i said to him look don't you understand that I was your advocate here? I worked as hard as I possibly could to get you what you wanted, and I got you three years of support instead of four, but that was a lot of money. And there was like silence on the other end of the phone because he hadn't realized that. He had taken the hard questioning and didn't realize that I had made a role shift. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that program officers do. So always, if you're in the position of asking for money, always thank your program officer mm -hmm. for uh, advocating on your behalf. Always. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you, you, you know it takes. It and really somebody really asked what prepares for you for this kind of job, or how do you get into it? I think you get into it by being really, well, there we heard some different ways. You can you know, be an active volunteer. Uh, but you can also be uh, um, a knowledgeable expert, and those are different ways to get into different <coughs> kinds of this work. Well, I, I would also recommend taking internships at mm -hmm. foundations. I mean, it, 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 you know, we're talking about foundations being exclusive. This, go, this is across all careers. Yeah. All careers are about networking, keeping your rate maintaining your relationships I and mean, we talked about people who we met along the way like you go on that informational interview you follow up with a thank you note and you let people know what happens you keep in touch with them so that when those positions do come up then though you they'll remember you right like that that is such an important part of this process and, and taking internships where possible. And, and so you asked that question about, um, you know, as, as a university student, you, you had the opportunity to review applications and such. So <coughs> that, that kind of process you can follow through along the way, whether it's within, you know, there may be some organizations on campus that have that opportunity or whether it's, you know, there now there's all kinds of contests around you know and, and many foundations are sort of working to that giving prizes for best whatever or most votes so there's an opportunity to do those kinds of things in my own case I did volunteer on s several sort of review committees which eventually uh, you know got me to to where I am um, so, so that certainly is an opportunity. And that happens, you know, and it doesn't ha only happen within the university setting. I was on review committees for, like, uh, <coughs> some, some federal grant-making programs. And even within your, within your city, there are opportunities sometimes within your government uh, departments that... And that learn to read a balance sheet. That's, that's important, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> well, and even, even becoming part of giving circles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right at at your local mm -hmm. community foundations, you've had your hand up for a long time. Yeah, well, I was. This I have two part two questions, and one is more general, um, because you guys have been in decision making process, decision making positions for such a long time. Um, you've kind of had a, you know, a way to kind of think about what what is innovative, what are the trends. If you wouldn't mind talking about the, the trends, um, the more innovative ideas of like, you know, community <coughs> service, but also of um, just ideas, you know, the ideas that people are coming up with um, and, and, um, and other projects that you think are the future, um, you know, that. And then one more specifically for Sujata, how do you, as somebody who has kind of migrated, um, how do you find ways 
to connect with your um, fourth place or make a, a, a difference there as well. Do you want to take the first question on innovation? If you have ideas, go ahead. I'll, 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 <laughs> no, I'll, 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 I'll let I'll you start. Because <laughs> <laughs> Can I put a slight spin on that, too? Because yeah. I was thinking about, so the program mm -hmm. officer is both a kind of critic and an advocate. Mm -hmm. But how do program officers have the ability to influence the interests of the foundation overall? Like, we sure. should move into sure. race and equity. We sure. should move into, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, again, every, you know, some foundations have a more, uh, a more specific governing mission. Uh, some have a mission that is defined by the donor, either or donors, many, many. Um, but in uh, some have quite a lot of openness. Um, when I first started at MacArthur, I would, I would get probably a hundred proposals just in the door, through the mail, in those days we had mail, um, and, um, <coughs> and I would actually look for patterns. I would look to say, well, you know, there are a lot of people who are worrying about interested in X, mm -hmm. uh, maybe let me, let's look into that field a little bit and see why, see what they think, what they understand the problem to be, what they understand the opportunities to be, and, um, and you know, see if we can make a contribution. And that was always the question, can we make a contribution? Uh, if, if it was going to be all be about industry change, probably not. Uh, but if there was some uh, social change we, that we could glimpse, uh, um, MacArthur was interested in policy responses. Uh, some places actually will, pro you know, fund direct services. Those are really different. So, you know, <coughs> what you're looking for. But innovation ideas. Um, I I can't even begin to answer that question unless I start with a field. You know, or or a social goal, mm -hmm. and if you start, you know, for me, that's that's how I think about things. So, but I'll give you a past example. Uh, around, in 1999, we kind of looked around and said, "Whoops! It looks like there's a lot of technical uh, technological change about to hit us." You know, um, <coughs> this was new new days for the internet, uh, and we said to ourselves, "Well." what role should we play in helping understand the changes at this point in time as far as we can and helping shape them towards social good? And so uh, being uh, an organization with plenty of resources, uh, we convened a bunch of meetings and we had a lot of experts come talk to us and we had a, just a myriad of really interesting ideas to explore and we ended up working on intellectual property first because we were in a point of inflection between that being industrial regulation to being uh, co consumer regulation. And guess who was at the table? It was the industries, not the consumers. So, um, so I, uh, uh, gosh, I mean, you know, I could start thinking about uh, interesting ideas, but, but they'd be all over the map. They wouldn't, it wouldn't be a, I wouldn't be able to give you a helpful answer. Uh, I think, though, that there's some some kind of <coughs> you know trends that are might be useful in pretty much any field. One is one I mentioned already: storytelling. Mm -hmm. Storytelling, people sharing their human experiences, has is just you know popping up everywhere you look and in every possible field, and it's I I think it's something just to keep in mind. Same with. Uh, telling stories or, or conveying information in multiple formats. Um, I think there are some indu you know changes in how really important services are delivered, and I think about one I worked in, which is news, news and information. Really different set of uh, organizations delivering that. In the arts, I would say that participation Rather, you know, not, not passive participation, but active participation is one of the trends. That's a through trend. Um, you know, and, and you all could do this, probably every one of you could do this in your own field. Uh, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not 
being very successful when I think about well, it one step up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's just to kind of think about some of the things, because we're so, we're working in such an environment that we kind of, you know, we have specific philosophers, specific theories, yeah. and, uh, you know, things like Iporias and whatnot. And so it's kind of very helpful. Like, we've been around Chicago and seen so many innovative works, so many things that have been funded by organizations like yours. And just to think about what what could be some of the things that you are working with in terms of funding, in terms of some things that are innovative that haven't necessarily or kind of approached certain things differently. So that so that actually leads me to just one more of my, my observations mm -hmm. about philanthropy. And that is that, uh, at least at the place I sat in philanthropy, our understanding of the world was broad but not deep. Mm -hmm. So the people we supported had the deep understanding and we could help each other because I could say to a, you know, a, a grantee in Chicago, here are five things you should know about around the country uh, that are similar to what you're working on. And they wouldn't have seen it because they're so busy in the day-to-day -day work, you know, in Chicago. And they could say to me, this is what my life is like, what my work life is like, and then I would understand that better, too. I have a very different experience. Um, again, the trust is a, just a different kind of foundation where we um, are, <coughs> because we can pool lots of different resources we have what are called funder collaboratives that are around um, specific topics whether it's around tech workforce development education where lots of foundations or individual donors pool their dollars to see if they can solve that social issue um, so the role we have back to roles again are not these are not program officers these are actual programs being run within the foundation um, under our larger umbrella so that gives us a lot of opportunities uh, around um, ideas that are in testing environments uh, so smart Chicago which is something that we do with the MacArthur Foundation around tech and data. The Ford Foundation came to us around uh, neighborhood high schools. We are doing a lot of work in um, with the American Disabilities Act and, and pushing that even farther in the Chicago region. And I'm currently working on a new, um, a new practice called Social Labs which is a, a new practice around how to solve complex issues. So we, we, are ha we have a more hands-on approach to innovation and testing ideas, but again, each foundation is different. So in, in our case, um, so the MacArthur Foundation was looking for like trends and what's happening and hearing about things. We look at our portfolio and see kind of what is missing. <coughs> So, so for instance, right now we're really concerned that we know from literature and everything that girls between the ages of 12, 8 and 12 sort of stop getting interested in science and math, but really that's, that's a strong pathway to any kind of future. Uh, so we're concerned about that. We also are concerned we have an aging population, but we have very little in our portfolio about older women. We know they live longer. We know they live with less economic security. So, so then those are the kinds of places we really try to, to fill and support. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, in terms of innovation, you know, we, we, we struggle with this because we try to understand what innovation really is. What we're really looking for then is kind of a unique idea that is not currently duplicated. Because our resources are fairly small, we're really looking to see where there is no duplication, where there's a unique idea that is going to cause some kind of social change in, in a fairly uh, <coughs> short period of time. So that's kind of our approach to it. So it either has to be what we call best practice or innovative, and that's kind of the, the filter we apply to, to some of our grants. Your second question about being an immigrant and having the connection back to the home country is is a difficult one. Um, it's it's one that like I see. I hope I see in my future. My my next uh, uh, my next role. My next uh, 
iteration of, of my career um, because it, it's, it's really hard. And I, I mentioned at the beginning that the reason I decided to do volunteer for so many years at Apnagar was truly because that was sort of the easiest way for me to give back to my home country, right? To people from my home country. Um, I, I n know the languages. I, you know, I, 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 I look familiar. I have a, I'm a familiar face. Um, so, th so that's the way. But it's very hard for me to do something in India. I mean, I get this question all the time. Do you know so-and-so or do you know groups in India that are doing this, that, and the other? And it's, it's I only know them because of family members or friends <coughs> who are doing the work, but I don't really have a good knowledge of what's going on there. I think I can better serve my community here. So I'm, I'm involved on in South Asian issues um, in, in, this, in the region, so I, I uh, I serve, um, or I have served to help on a South Asian research and policy group where we work with other, other Asian community organizations to develop research that will um, ad advance certain policy issues for the South Asian community in the region. So that's kind of um, the role to get back. <coughs> Can you um, talk a little bit about Lizzie's question? Because as you were talking, Sujata, you were raising that issue of passion, passion versus skills and experience, or passion commitment. Because I was thinking, you know, obviously, Shaw, you have such a passion for ephemera and urban public art, but and that turns out to be a really useful tool for your organization, but you didn't go to community trust and they're like, we got to do support this, <laughs> or Elspeth, you know, like you have to dive into a lot of different areas, and it's uh, that kind of research skills, your ability to get up to speed on something that can make you realize you should focus <coughs> on intellectual property or... So I'm just curious if there's more to say about this balance in, in doing this kind of work. Like, I really think that the culture of the place you're working is, the, is very key. Mm -hmm. um, um, that passion is not, has never been um, a good thing to show too much of <laughs> at MacArthur. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to put it. Um, <laughs> It is a little more like an academic institution in that respect, that, you know, that you're supposed to be really smart and analytical um, and, uh, you know, go operate more from the head than the heart. Um, but there are certainly, you know, foundations and places where, <laughs> As being like one yours. Of <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't work at CFW if you aren't passionate about uh, the inequities for women and girls. It's, it's that simple. We are a progressive public foundation. Our focus is on gender and everyone who comes, even our staff meetings, at, at the end of every staff meeting, we, you know, often somebody brings an article, uh, a topic <coughs> that's been in the papers that, that we end up sort of talking and digesting. And, and so, so unless you really care about the issues. So it, it depends if, if you're more a general foundation, but when, when you have a specific issue, I think it's but, different. But I want to be I want to be fair because I, I kind of <coughs> slammed the Ford Foundation a minute ago. <laughs> and I actually think Darren Walker is it's really sincere and really passionate about what he's trying to do. Uh, my skepticism comes from the size of that place. It is yeah. just, it's, it's a hardship to turn, and I don't know that you know, w w that he's focusing on that rather than his own kind of leadership message. Um, I, I think that, you know, we keep talking about program, you know, that there are so many roles in a foundation, and one of the easiest ways into nonprofit is learning to be a fundraiser, right? And, and you have those skills as well, right? The written skills, the ability, really the ability to communicate and the storytelling. And with those <coughs> roles, if, you, if you're working for just a traditional nonprofit, your passion has to be about the place that you're raising money for. And in a career that can constantly shift. When you're at uh, the, a community foundation and we're encouraging people to bring their dollars to the foundation, you almost have to like balance your passion because you don't want to 
it, it, the, those donors don't want to be influenced, right? So like there's this constant balance yeah. of <coughs> when, you know, our, our fundraisers are very successful and you, I would never know what they are personally passionate about. Um, so, so I just want to. I, I, I've got to <laughs> chime in on the on the development the, the development opportunity. I, I actually got into foundation work from running a nonprofit. You know, mm -hmm. I told you I told you my my tr career trajectory. That's was a great way to get to know mm -hmm. foundations. foundations. Um, I did raise money as that mm -hmm. uh, in that role. It wasn't the only thing I did. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, development officers at their best are just amazing, you know, admirable mm -hmm. uh, uh, professionals. But um, it's very hard to jump from being solely a development officer to being a program officer at a foundation. Yep. However, if you get the relationships in, with foundations by doing program work at a nonprofit that includes fundraising, uh, then you have this sort of professional standing that a foundation looks for as well as, as the relationships that come from fundraising. Well, the, the going from development to an executive director that in a nonprofit is, is, is I think is just like sort of one of the easiest routes to becoming an executive director is through that. Yeah, I, uh, <coughs> yeah you have examples in your mind. I can't think of any at the moment, but yeah. But yeah. yeah. It's particularly smaller ones. Yeah. Ability to raise money. Um, on the note of fundraising, um, one of the things that we've been thinking about is 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 money. Um, and I don't know if I'm just speaking for myself, but it's baffling to me how to like the fun, the whole fundraising thing is like baffling to me. Whether it's through like entrepreneurial, like I want to start like some sort of strange thing or like fundraising for like a nonprofit. Like I don't what? Like it's just it's like a shadowy strange place. And I guess I'd like to speak maybe more like in specifics and like concrete yep. you know, just like oh, like because we get like all, all of, a lot of like you networking, but I'm like I don't even know how to move from like networking to like asking for money. Like does that make sense? That was sort of bad. No, so so here see if if this answer works for you um, m my development director she is she's fabulous um, so she says it's about inspiring people to give people want to give people want to give money and if if you share their passion for what it is and if you share kind of how you're going to help them realize the change they want to see that it's it's a it's all about that relationship it's it is about building a relationship it's not a one-time transaction right especially if you want the person to give again and again um, so people do want to give it's not that they don't want to give money including program officers we we are obliged to to give out the money not hold on to it right so you have to be able to sort of inspire but having said that the important thing is to ask you, so you can have a relationship. Well, yeah, isn't it like I was Whoever that? is interested in the work that you're doing, so. And that there, there are researchers, right? Like, I, I, and research is an important component of a development yeah. department because yeah. there's someone has to figure out who's interested in these who's issues. Interested. What's their pattern of giving? What are their what are their broad set of interests? So you can actually, because this ability to be able to talk to anyone and connect anyone to the mission is right. You need so there are people who kind of create that. Materials for the. I don't think it should be so baffling, but I uh, because um, because most I mean there is a piece of it that I'm going to get to in a moment that is, that is baffling to me, so probably is to other people as well. But you know there's a piece of the of the fundraising fund fund giving relationship that's very institutionalized. So you're working with a program or a project that has a 501c3. You know, so it's a, a you know a designated nonprofit, and it's going to designated givers, foundations who have stated their interests. So that that's that's one way the relationship works. And you that in that relationship, you just try to find the match between their interests and what you do. Telling them what their interests should be, should be when they've stated something else is never going to work. That's just a little right. tip for everybody. 
Um, there, then there's the second thing of, I am an individual, you know, who wants to raise money to fund my trip, my research trip to whatever. That's a different, a different set of institutionally defined opportunities, and, and you probably know what they are. If you don't, your universities certainly do, and you go out and you try to find them. But then there's a third thing that I wanted to mention, because even though all three of us are sort of rooted in the nonprofit sector, the more I hear, so, uh, talk about new ideas, the more I hear about p younger people, younger professionals, including some of you, many of you, uh, is that those with social missions are not always choosing the nonprofit um, option to exercise them. So uh, they, they want to make, make a particular kind of social change. They can choose to do it the nonprofit way and go through foundations and fundraising, or they can choose to go the for-profit way and try to raise capital. And, um, and there's a different set of, of fundraising skills, options, uh, resources, uh, which I don't know very much about, so I couldn't help you. But uh, <coughs> go to any business school, and they'll tell you all about it because they're, you know, they're they're very aware that they're that people are not seeing the for-profit nonprofit divide in the same way that a gener it was seen a generation ago. Um, and then the part that baffles me. Uh, so maybe uh, you guys have the answer to this, but I, uh, I certainly don't. And that is as this kind of inequality of wealth and income that we're always tearing our hair about in this society, it's also an opportunity. You know, there are more and more and more wealthy people. How do you find them? How do you ask them to support you? Some of them go to the trust and, and you know, put their donor advised funds there, but lots of them don't. And I don't, I don't understand and I especially, this comes up over and over and over again with the arts. Um, how do you find those wealthy donors who haven't put their head up very much yet, but who might like your particular piece of work? So also, um, I don't know if you've ever fundraised to run a race, to, um, to do point. something, to start a club in your school. So bad, bad. <laughs> like asking people for money. <laughs> you, start, you always start with friends and family because they'll support you. That's like the first place to start. Well, whether you're whether it's sort of an entrepreneurial yeah. one or whether it's for a nonprofit, if That's good. they they care about you. So, for instance, we had a young woman years ago who it was I think her 25th birthday or whatever, and so she said, "Well, I don't want any presents this year." I want you to give to Chicago Foundation for Women, to the Young Women's Giving Council. I'm part of it. And she raised a ton of money for, for the group. So that's the sort of the simplest way that I can think of. Like, you start there, and then it becomes easier to ask, you know, as you go into more and more um, difficult situations or... But it More should complex. be very easy to ask people who are being paid to give. That that should you should <laughs> never ever 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 hesitate. You know, it, if somebody works at a foundation, they're being paid to give. So you should feel uh, totally unapologetic about asking. Mm. So I have a question about um, people moving between roles at foundations. Uh, so moving from development to like a program officer, or I'm particularly interested in communications. Yeah. And um, you know, how, how does, uh, does that happen? Um, you know, no, <laughs> you're saying no. <laughs> from communications to development, yeah. or? Uh, just generally, yeah. Um, maybe to a program officer, but you know, yeah. It's very hard, very okay. hard. Uh, we at MacArthur have a lot of, of really, really highly educated administrative staff people. And uh, there is almost no opportunity to move into a program role. I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't start there with the expectation of moving up. Yeah. Unless you hear that that particular institution yeah. does that. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our admins tend to, many of them have master's degrees, and they, they don't, that jump is is so I mean the program officers generally um, have well established careers within their subject matter that that tends to be the model 
Um, I think the foundation is a little, the community trust is a little different because our civic engagement work is part of our communication division and we do more programming and also do some grant making out of that space, but it's highly unusual. This is uh, kind of a related question. Um, it's actually two questions, but one is with the internship slash volunteering, does it matter what you intern volunteer in? Um, and then the other question is related to, um, I guess more specifically, if you do have, for example, like lots of really random kinds of experiences because you had to mostly because you had to make money but also because uh, but you sort of realized like I worked in catering for a really long time I know how to run an event um, I don't know how to leverage those kinds of like I guess then you have a four page resume or whatever it is these experiences into sort of a logical um, I don't know I, I wonder if you can talk about yeah so that's that's your related to your question yeah. about a coherent narrative yeah. right so, uh, so when I when I applied for the position at Abnagar, the the nonprofit, um, the the resume I presented to them was less than <coughs> three quarters of a page. Although you know I'd had my PhD, I had publications, I'd worked in industry, all of that kind of stuff, but the, what I presented to to them was didn't didn't even fill a page. It really was truly just relevant to what they were looking for. I mean, it's a different story that they took a chance on me in spite of that. So it's not always the number of pages. Um, so, so that's, I think, the way to start because I, I hear this all the time that people tell you, you need to have a resume for the job that you're applying for or for the person you're talking to. So I think crafting based on the experiences that you have that are relevant, I think is, is most important. So who cares, you know, about my papers on, on cement, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. Well, yeah, so I guess I have a slightly different take on this. I, I had, you know, uh, unlike Cheryl, I didn't have a, like a destination in mind. I've always <laughs> sort of meandered and um, and I'm doing it again. <laughs> um, but I think you can take those <coughs> experiences and really, really distill what you know. So you know some things about people. You know, you know, from, from catering for all, all this time. You, you know, you know things that are applicable um, about, you know, about planning. You know, you, those, these, are, these are skills that can make a narrative that can not to say, well, I, I did all this and, um, and now I'm ready to do this other thing because of that, but to basically say, here are some of the things I've, I, I understand and have learned about. I mean, understanding how to manage people is it's kind of like writing. It's one of those skills that not enough people have and that you use in every job, even if you're, even if you're managing up or sideways. Uh, or you know one intern you know managing people is is something that oh my goodness I've seen so many places where nobody had that skill so if you can sort of think about what you've gotten out of your past and you know and and take your three quarters of a page to write that how what you know would apply to that next job. I, I think that becomes a, a narrative. Uh, if you actually know where you're going, then you can do what Cheryl did, which is great. That's a great story. I meandered <laughs> quite a bit as well. But I, I, I would, just a more tactical um, approach, just dropping your resume in the mail, the, doesn't work anymore. Well, in fact, the mail doesn't work, right? Just sending, <laughs> sending uh, your resume off. Um, particularly if you're going to a, lar a large institution, so much of this is automated, they're going to be looking for keywords that connect with the job description. Your cover letter is your narrative. And writing 
a cover letter that tells your story that connects with that job description is your key in. <coughs> so you really do almost have to be selective about what you're going to apply for because you need to spend time actually crafting your narrative to that that position um, because likely the first person who's going to see it is in HR not the people that you'll report to and they're going to find follow that narrative in their own way. They're very literal. Very <laughs> literal. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and so sort of related to that. So don't submit your cover letter and resume separately. This is the latest tip I heard. <laughs> yes. Put them in a one PDF because the HR people separate them. them. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. And that, that's why it's another important is that informational interviews, your connections and informational <laughs> interviews will lead to probably more opportunities than just answering uh, e answering job announcements. Hey, Sophia, just had a follow-up to that yes. question. Um, oh, so I'm, um, Elspeth, you mentioned earlier that for specialized positions, you look for specialized people, so like someone with a background in international relations or something. And um, I've seen people, like I'm in philosophy, you don't find a lot of job postings for philosophers, um, but, but one of my advisors was the epistemologist on a group of people working on making my brother's keeper gender neutral, for example. So like I know it's possible. Um, how much room is there for specialized job postings to, to have the opportunity to explain, to, to translate your background into being, um, into fitting into that, yeah. You can't unless you have someone to talk to about it. Okay. Um, it, it, it doesn't just, you know, the, the, in both applying for money and applying for a job, to try to s explain why you don't really fit, but you'd be right for that mm -hmm. grant or job, it's not going to work unless you actually get a get a you know have a conversation. Um, that said, you know, we hired at MacArthur lots of people who <coughs> didn't quite have the right degree, mm -hmm. but they had some really interesting, relevant experience, and they had the right skills. And we, you know, and they could speak our language. And those are all things that having a philosophy degree, you know, is, is not, not a bad preparation for us. So, so I, I wouldn't feel discouraged with it, but I also think that, you know, you may not be getting a philosophy position <laughs> if you move into a foundation. That's the Lizzie in the back here with questions. Question. Uh, you mentioned that, I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that uh, fundraising is, is a way in, um, into a lot of, lot of non-profits. And I'm, I was wondering, uh, in terms of our collective experiences with like applying for grants and like winning some of them, would that like give us an edge or, you know, Yes, yes, Make yes, us yes, more. yes, 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 you got to pick for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, don't you yes, think? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, uh, these days, pretty much anyone who's made it up to your level of academia has, has you know, applied for and been awarded yeah. something, okay. and that, that's definitely part of a, a ba good background. My question is also about money, <laughs> but in a different way. Back to kind of actually John's question in terms of um, how it seems like it's kind of difficult to move um, around positions in, in a, for example, a nonprofit organization. Um, and so you three do very different things at very different kinds of. Um, Can I just stop you? Don't forget yeah. your question. I was that wasn't the question I was answering. I was answering about foundations. Sure. I think it actually is, I would have a different answer for a nonprofit. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, after was yesterday's question, can we create yeah. that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. It might be, a, a recap of that might be useful. I don't know. I was just, I guess I'm going to direct this at, at you, Sujata, since you're in a, uh, a specific nonprofit um, organization. What, could you, could you give us an idea of what, um, kind of most people who stay with the organization for 5, 10, 15 years, yeah. what kinds of positions they top out at and what the range of salaries in those positions yeah. are? So, we're, as I said, we're, we're really small, yeah. we're 14 people. Um, 
so the the person who's been with us the longest, um, she is uh, our VP of finance. She didn't start with a CPA or anything like that. In fact, she she but she'd been working in accounting. She just finished her uh, her her BA a few years ago. Um, it varies again like this is the the question about money is is so hard to because it depends on the size of the organization's budget it depends on you know sort of other relevant spaces so i'm not really trying to uh, sort of sidestep the question our salaries are a little less than they would be at either institution, in fact, quite a little bit less <laughs> than either institution. Um, so our program officer who who has been with us and I've worked with her for a long time and who's been promoted to program officer has a degree in art history <coughs> and, um, and has been with us, as I said, a, a fairly long time. She, she, work, she is paid somewhere in the mid 50s, uh, you know, low 60s, I think we would top out only because we we don't necessarily hire the specialist, uh, you know, issue area specialists. Um, we also are are small. Our revenue is small, but I've had folks who applied for the position, who worked elsewhere, uh, who made eighty in the eighties and and high nineties. So it it really varies a lot. It, so. Did you add did, did you add other people? <laughs> okay. I think we wanted to also circle back to the yeah. question, oh, sure. and then we'll go to Justin of nonprofit and mobility within roles. Yeah, so you said there might be more mobility at, at nonprofit. Yeah, I, I actually think that's the case because um, you know, frankly, if I were advising people about starting in nonprofit work, uh, I would say try to so find an organization that where you share a passion for the mission and you've heard very good things about the management of the place. Absolutely true. And if you've heard very good things about how the place is managed, the, the staff is happy, uh, people seem to be, you know, working towards the, you know, towards the same mission. You, if you find a good, if you work for a good manager, your skills will be recognized. And over time, if you just work your heart out and show them how good you are, um, and then, you know, notice opportunities and ask if you can, you know, move into them. And uh, you, at, an, at, a, at a smaller, more flexible organization, you will find your way to, a, you know, often a greater and greater responsibility. That's, you know, when I said earlier that learning to work in a, work in organization. I mean, I actually was able to do that at MacArthur. I'm one of very few people who's moved up at MacArthur. Um, it's, it's really hard in a place like that. And, you know, it's a combination of luck and having worked for the city of Chicago, knowing <laughs> how to manage bureaucracies that way. But, uh, but in a nonprofit, it, it's not so much about luck. It's about, you know, having the right pieces in place. Would be, that would be my view. And I would add to that, um, when you're in small nonprofits or mid-size, um, answer it, it, yes, I'd love to help with that rather than no. No, that's not my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Will pay dividends and, and open doors to opportunities. And give you experience. Absolutely. And sometimes those experiences get you your next job. Yeah. And connect you to mm -hmm. a range of people as well. Make, make a huge difference. Thank you. Hey, Justin and Linda. Yeah, so I have a question about, the, um, I guess, the relationship between a program officer and potential grantee. It's kind of going back a little bit, but I wanted to ask if you, I guess, how you talked about the probing and critiquing of the grantee and what you propose. How much of that relationship is also like consulting? So, in other words, uh, like for instance, the tips that you give and like how that mm -hmm. maybe changes the contours of what's not only what's being proposed, but if it's like an annual grant that needs to be renewed, have you, you know, seen that change in the mission statement or changing maybe some of the, not actual mission, but like the language of how they're articulating what they're doing? Um, and the second question is, if you had examples of stronger versus weaker grants that you've seen, maybe tips 
because I work with nonprofits, so like, you know, tips of like what makes it uh, proposal. I think you and I would answer that quite differently. So, yeah, I I, so I think I think the first is very dicey territory. Yeah. Very dicey yeah. for a program officer to do. As as Elspeth mentioned, you know, we're not in the business of telling you what to do. I mean, most program officers have worked with a set of guidelines and really are looking to see if you're pro uh, anything that doesn't fit, that you're trying to fit into that is mission drift for the organization. Don't recommend it. And we, we tell people who are reviewing applications and going on site visits that they're not there to give ideas and tips, but really to learn, because ultimately the or the nonprofit that is seeking is seeking money. They have been doing the work; they know the ins and out. And so, for me to tell you something different really doesn't make sense. So that's the first part of the question. And I would I absolutely, completely agree. But I see it happen a lot. I know mm -hmm. it does. And yeah. um, it does and the problem is the power dynamic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like if you know the Ford Foundation program officer just to you know mention <laughs> one at random is not in the room, um, you know shows up at your office and says, "Gee, I really like this piece of your work," and if you did it, you know it. 10 times that much, uh, 10 times what you're doing now in that area, and a lot less of the other things you're doing, we'll give you money, you know, and um, I mean, this happens all the time. This is the problem. It, it happens happen all the time. It does happen all And lot. then, you know, you wake up three years later and they're not renewing their grant, and your organization has gone in a direction that's not what you intended. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but it's very hard to go say back to that program officer, you know, uh, this is not us, you know, we will, we, you know, is there any other way you can help us? I guess also, because attached to the question is like the, this notion of evaluation, and I'm like fascinated by the fact that like half the stuff you can't evaluate, like how do you, you know, from a qualitative stand standpoint, um, so when it does come to reviewing it and uh, you're trying to figure out if there were successes and failures um, of the projects that were proposed. Uh, how do that, you was do some, that was actually something else I wanted to say to all of you. Um, I've been working in uh, in uh, the sort of nonprofit investigative reporting sphere for a while, and uh, there was a one of the national organizations, might have been SSRC, I'm not sure, provided some fellows to some of the nonprofits. Um, they were social science uh, people, not humanities people. They have made a huge contribution to those organizations in helping figure out how to assess the hard to measure. Mm -hmm. um, there, sometimes it's just a role for someone with an academic training and knowledge to go into a very applied environment uh, if they can kind of keep a foot in each world. Um, I, so that was apart from your question, but I did want to mention that because, you know, there, there are occasionally opportunities like that. What was that second question of yours? So one oh, was about... About, t about sort of tips um, or like examples that you saw like... Good, uh, good really proposals versus yeah, bad proposals. Yeah. I'll tell you one of my pet peeves, two of my pet peeves <laughs> for proposals. This is good, thank uh, you. One <laughs> is... Unless you're absolutely sure, don't use the word unique. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It always put my back up because it always made me want to go think about all the other to, yeah. to fact check it, you know. Yeah. So that was that was one thing. The second thing is you don't have to rehash the grant maker's guidelines in your proposal. <coughs> they, you know, you can assume that the grant maker knows their their guidelines, and um, and and if you're trying to kind of re-explain re your work in, so that it fits better, um, that's going to be totally transparent. Yeah, and sort of related to that, don't argue if, if the program officer is telling you, well, this doesn't really fit. Don't, don't <laughs> argue. Um, and then I'll give you another tip. It varies from foundation to foundation again. Um, so some foundations, like ours, will actually have a conversation before you apply. If you're willing to pick up the phone and call and share your concept, it, then 
you have half the work done because then they'll tell you yes yes it works no it doesn't and you don't have to spend all that time filling out all the paperwork so that's a that's so figure out which foundations will take your call and do that sort of first I, I want to add in just uh, something that we haven't talked about it and that is there's a difference between sponsorship and grants and a lot of times what gets submitted <coughs> are sponsorship requests. Very, 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 very different. Excuse me? Especially to you guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, it's um, that, and, and actually funders make a big mistake around, especially um, corporations tend to, they say they're giving grants, but they're really focused on sponsorship. They're very different sets of expectations so it's just something to be aware of like a sponsorship the the giving entity is getting back assets and a grant is an expectation of service to a community that i mean that's how i would frame it but they get, it, there's a lot of crossover these days in in that type of work in this making sure my logo is everywhere it it just becomes more and more complex but there tends to be a lot of money in sponsorship um we're gonna have to wrap it there okay because we're out of time um but i promise you we'll have way more opportunity to kind of test and explore these ideas um because we'll be doing some role playing at the joyce foundation this <laughs> afternoon <laughs> while you'll be taking on roles as grantees, program officers, or board members. So, um, I and I have to do some housekeeping with you, but I just want to thank <coughs> Cheryl 